Switched on IT is proudly brought to you by Computer Troubleshooters to Wimble West and Oz Hosting Cloud Made Easy. Welcome to Switched on IT. I'm Barry. Uh, this is the show where we talk about everything IT. In the last few weeks, uh, we have talked about coronavirus because uh, that's the uh, current topic. And although at PTV Channel O, we are not doing a particular series on uh, coronavirus, mainly because uh, there's plenty of information out there and we don't want to confuse it. In this show, it's Switched on IT, we have been focusing on coronavirus simply because it's not something that there is a lot of information out there about uh, on regular TV. So uh, today we're going to continue that series on coronavirus and Doug and Ray are going to talk today about something that's a little bit different and not something that has been covered off by anybody else to my knowledge and that is what is coming out of the coronavirus what are the permanent changes that are likely to happen and we've been hearing things like this is the new normal and things like that but even in some of those reports we haven't actually discussed in detail what impact permanently this is going to have on businesses and how businesses need to adapt to that. Now, Doug and Ray are with us now. Hello, gentlemen. How are you today? Pretty good. Good to see you, Barry. You too. Well. Hello, Ray. Hi there. Now, Ray, uh, talk to us about the uh, sort of thing off, off camera um, earlier. We were talking about the sorts of impacts that coronavirus and working from home and things like that are uh, going to have on businesses around town centres that people would generally visit. Uh, talk to us about that and the sort of impact that that's going to have going forward. Yeah, sure. So I have been paying a lot of attention to the recovery uh, process uh, since I work with uh, the small business development centers in the United States. Uh, helping small businesses recover from this pandemic is, you know, one of our primary uh, charges. And recently payments, which is P-Y-M-N-T-S, so payments without the volume, uh, without the, uh, the vowels, um, they put out a report uh, called Main Street on Lockdown, Reinventing the Road to Recovery. And in this report, they, um, they, they point out a couple of really interesting things. They surveyed a thousand small businesses, I'm presuming in the United States, but I'm not sure. I think they did. Yeah, it was United States. And, uh, and so they just, they just surveyed the, this thousand small business owners about um, what they thought about the ongoing pandemic um, and uh, basically um, afterward. And what surprised me, and, and the, the report notes that it was surprising to them, is that nearly 70% of SMBs um, believed uh, or currently believe they're just going to return to pre-pandemic business models after this is all over and things will just go back to normal. And that was, uh, it, it was both shocking to me, but also really in, important for me to start putting the message out there that this will not be the same when this is all over. And not just because of the fact that we may all be able to um, have high consumer confidence. We may have, uh, you know, a lot of people who are very um, excited to get back to normal, uh, but we don't control the situation. And there are economic forces in play that we just aren't quite aware of. Uh, so for example, as you noted, we have main street districts and downtown areas uh, that are going to be impacted in uh, unknown ways. And, um, and so I'm, I'm just a little bit more, um, you know, uh, concerned about those Main Street districts that ultimately support many, many thousands of small businesses uh, throughout, you know, globally, throughout many countries. And um, and when they're impacted, that has a trickle-down effect uh, that really starts to hurt people uh, at large. And so, uh, Doug, you were talking a little bit about the concept of employees uh, deciding whether or not to, uh, you know, go back to the office. What are your thoughts there about how many people will go back to their offices downtown and back to their offices in uh, you know the office complexes around the country and around the globe um, when this is all over? 
Yeah, it's 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 a, a forecast at the moment, but um, you know, in a, in a sense, the genie is out of the bottle, and um, a large, very large percentage of the you know what was traditionally the the CBD office based workforce has been working remotely in Australia, and and certainly from the perspective of Oz Hosting and a, and a, a provider of of IT services, this has put an enormous load on the business where. So many people found that, hey, you know, picking up the laptop and just working from home, um, not everything worked the way they expected it to work. They, you know, their, their ability to be productive, to share files effectively, to use Teams or Zoom or um, have the right licenses and the right productivity tools. It, it played out in a quite, um, you know, difficult way for, for a lot of people. But, but now we're six weeks or a couple of months into that. I think what we can see certainly in Australia is that there is a huge number of the, the, the sort of office-based population that could work remotely um, and now have now got that sorted and they are working remotely. So I think we can expect that, that a significant percentage, it could be as high as, as 20% of, um, of, of the workers that have been working remotely will um, shift well, we'll make that that permanent. So that might be, you know, that might be one in five people um, keep, continues to work remotely, but it's probably more likely that the twenty percent of the hours that used to be um, done in in an office environment will now be will now be done remotely. So you know, some people are going to work one day a week from home. Other people might work three days a week from home. Some people might. Continue, you know, as soon as they can continue to work five days a week from from the office in the CBD, but twenty percent, a twenty percent reduction in the amount of traffic in the CBD is a twenty percent reduction uh, potentially in the revenue, in the income, in the expenditure by all of those workers in the in the coffee shops, the restaurants, the sandwich shops, you know, the, the clothing shops, and so on. And I think you know the. Barry, at the outset, we were talking about some of the permanent shifts that we might expect as a consequence of, of COVID-19. Um, and I certainly think that, that um, for, for, for businesses that have been, been uh, reliant on that kind of customer base, um, they're going to see a permanent, a permanent change come out of this. Um, Ray, yeah, CNBC in terms reported. Of, mm -hmm. I was going to say, Ray, they, you know, there's there's some uh, you know some some known trends there, and I think you were just about to comment on those. So so go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, CNBC recently talked about the fact that that twenty percent number is uh, from a survey of employees. A uh, company called Get Abstract, the publishing company, uh, surveyed I think it was twelve hundred employees, and twenty percent of them basically said we're not going back to the office after this is all done. Uh, Twitter uh, just noted uh, that. They basically have told all of their employees they can work from home forever, uh, you know. And so uh, Facebook and Google and others have basically said you're working from home until the end of the year, potentially longer than that. And so, uh, you know, while while that is not necessarily an, an issue of, you know, Facebook uh, has a huge campus where they have their own chefs and their own uh, kind of economy, so to speak. Uh, Google has the Googleplex where they have their own, uh, you know, space and time it, so it feels like, uh, but they, they, you know, they, they employ hundreds, you know, more than 100,000 people around the planet. Uh, those people working remotely now um, have a, a, a downstream effect. But the bigger concern that I have is that because these big employee giants, uh, the, you know, these giants of industry have now um, decided to, to remove the stigma and show that this can be done. Uh, we're going to see a, a large number of people say, wait, if, you know, these folks can do it, um, then absolutely I want to do it. I want to be able to have the flexibility of doing so. And because that means that less people are congregating in, uh, you know, centralized areas in metropolitan or urban areas, uh, that leads to uh, less of them spending money in those spaces and more of them spending money uh, both, you know, closer to home which is good for the businesses that are closer to the to the residencies of these people, uh, but also more uh, mobile and online, uh, you know, transactions. So we're going to see a lot more delivery. We're going to see a lot more, uh, you know, online uh, purchases and shipping based businesses 
uh, you know, uh, excel and, and exceed their expectations in, in terms of that. But I, I am very concerned about the Main Street District uh, type businesses and the downtown businesses that just, you know, the 70% of them that think we're just going to go back to pre-pandemic, uh, you know, uh, business models and be just fine. I, I really want everybody to get uh, a nice sobering uh, look in the mirror and recognize that this is not going to be the same as it was for the business. We're already in a, in a shutdown phase for a lot of these businesses. They don't have the kinds of uh, either credit lines or savings to be able to, to withstand the length of shutdown uh, without a, a, a large amount of government um, infusion of, of, of safety net there. And that I'm not, I just don't think we're gonna get it. Uh, and so that means those businesses um, out the gate won't sh won't survive, and then the ones that do are going to have to deal with the uh, the long term consequences of a couple of things. One is that um, even after we start reopening and we start seeing people um, come out of uh, their cocoons, their homes, and they they want to spend, they want to go out and do those things, uh, but they're going to be fearful, um, especially as we see pockets, different countries. Um, have flare ups, you know, you had had Singapore and South Korea that that, you know, did a really bang up job in terms of, uh, you know, high levels of testing, high levels of contact tracing, and really taking care of the virus up front, uh, but still have flare ups afterward. And so uh, think about that here in the United States, where we have different states operating independent of one another, um, and they're opening up and they're they're still on the case increase, and they're opening up their their, uh, their economies to start moving again, uh, that's going to create all of these kinds of like, you know, it's going to be a fire here, you stamp it out there, you get a fire here, you stamp it out there. And what that really is going to do is it's going to it's going to decrease people's, uh, you know, ability to go out there and feel confident that they can go back to work, that they can go to the grocery store, that they can go to the mall and feel safe. And that's the kind of thing that I'm really concerned about is that after this is all over, there's going to be a period of time. I don't know how long it is. But there's going to be a period of time where consumer fears are going to trump consumer spending. And um, and you need to presume that you're going to lose 20% if you're in a downtown district, you're going to lose X percentage more from just people not wanting to put themselves and their families at risk. Uh, you know, it, it's just it's just a matter of, of reality factor here that we all have to take into account, which means that on the flip side of this, uh, what businesses and how businesses adapt is really going to be about online and mobile. How are they really going to make their businesses digital? It's not about retail going away. I think it's very much about businesses understanding that if they can adapt and really modify their businesses to transition to uh, have digital as another option, that they will actually see themselves be more resilient, not just for this pandemic, but for other economic downturns and other kinds of disasters and, and tragedies that might uh, befall them. Doug, what are, what are your suggestions for folks as they're thinking about post-pandemic uh, in terms of what they should be doing about choosing uh, the right ways to go digital? It's, it's, a, it's hard to, to provide something that's too, too prescriptive uh, in a situation like that because so many businesses, they have their, their unique attributes. But, but one thing you know, is, is for sure that they need to look at their existing um, you know, online digital um, uh, the, the, the operational uh, aspects of their business that are, that are online, that are digital, you know, whether it's mobile, whether it's having uh, an ability to book, book appointments or to book product or to, to book any sort of services online, um, how they're communicating and how they're managing with that channel. And even for a lot of businesses, it would be, you know, potentially it could be a really, really small part of their business. But that is where the learning is for them and for their business to drill down into that and to see what it is that they might be able to do better um, using all the different digital online uh, resources that are, get, that, that are available to them right now. And I think this is just a, um, you know, in, in some sense, it's, it's just going to force businesses away from tr a traditional sort of bricks and mortar operational concept of their business to something which is, you know, significantly more of a blend. So if they're a, you know, if they're a coffee shop or if they're a restaurant or if they're, you know, a, a hair salon or something like that, they, they probably have um, online bookings and online communication programs. They're going, to, they're going to start to change where they're thinking about, okay, well, how do we, how do we enhance our delivery capabilities? How do we sort of deliver dinner parties at, at home, for instance, or something like that? And particularly in, in so many uh, Western countries, we've got a massive problem with, 
you know, with allergies. So now, you know, online capabilities are, are, are a really underutilised way of people that have got allergies scanning a menu, being able to say, look, I've got this allergy, I've got that allergy, I can't have gluten or I can't have this, that or the other thing. At the moment, I haven't seen really any great applications that allow people to, um, uh, you know, maybe book a place at a restaurant or some or book some takeaway and easily, you use it in a user-friendly way, select, um, you know, a, a meal which is going to suit them and, and cater to the, to the different allergies that, that they might have. So that's just one example of, you know, I think that the kind of thinking that small businesses are going to have to do to make sure that they they preserve their um, you know their revenue stream because I, I totally agree. You know, if if there's a twenty percent reduction in foot traffic, you know, we were talking before about a you know a, a, a sound that does ten thousand dollars a week in the Sydney CBD. That would be you know quite a, a, a not an unusual expectation for a sandwich shop in the CBD. Now at the moment they're probably doing you know seventy or eighty percent off that, um, even if the, the, when everything comes back supposedly to normal, they're only doing $8,000 a week, on normal margins, that's not viable. So I think what we're going to also see um, as one of the permanent sort of outcomes of, of COVID-19 is there's going to need to be a recalibration of a lot of the input costs. And obviously, I'm thinking, um, you know, the, 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 the rents charged for, you know, CBD retail and also the rents charged for CBD office space because I think what we're going to see is that there's, you know, the, the need for office space um, in 2021 in CBD areas is going to have diminished quite a lot. And this is one of the areas where, you know, the genie has sort of come out of the bottle and that is, um, as you were talking before, Ray, about, about sentiment. Our, our sentiment about so many important things has changed very significantly. And, and, you know, certainly um, a lot of people are that, that they are actually working longer hours now in a COVID-19 environment because they've been given back one to two hours of commute time that they lost before. And so, you know, for a, a lot of people are going to be able to, to say with, with a, you know, a good degree of conviction and accuracy that they should not be going back to the office because they put in more hours of productive effort as a remote worker than they ever could as, as somebody attending an office. And I think for a lot of businesses, um, they're going to accept that. Um, and, and so we're going to see that a lot of people won't be returning to the CVD. And so, and so this has made a, a very sort of permanent change. Um, I think the other changes in, in sentiment that are going to be permanent are changes in the way um, people consume some services. Like what are people going to think about not just going on cruise ships, but air travel and being in confined spaces and, and you know, staying in, in uh, population, uh, you know, densely populated hotels and resorts. Um, all of these things are going to change, you know, quite significantly. And the businesses that are involved in that need to, to really think about how they're going to address these, these uh, um, changes in sentiment that start to become quite permanent. Doug... Um... Let me just ask you something, uh, just to go back to a uh, comment that you were just making about commuting. Uh, we're hearing governments now say, oh, um, in order to stimulate the economy, we need to be pouring millions of dollars into uh, roads and all the rest of it. Do you think that maybe that kind of spending is now misplaced and that what we ought to be doing is spending our infrastructure spending on improving the network for um, remote, so NBN and things like that? Look, I, I, in brief, I'd say no, we need both. Um, certainly the the road infrastructure around Australia and between the states, you know, between Sydney and, and Melbourne and Brisbane and um, Adelaide and Canberra and so on, needs to be improved. And, and the, the, the road infrastructure around these big cities needs to be improved because when you look at the, the, uh, the mix of traffic, not a huge amount of it is actually commuter traffic. Um, people going to work tend to you use a lot of um, public transport. Sure, there, there's always those people that, that can't because of, you know, their tradies or, or whatever that might be. But, the, but a huge amount of the traffic 
on, on the road network is actually commercial traffic. And we need to be able to move, um, you know, product in supply lines and supply chains from, from one part of the city to the other part of the city quickly and efficiently. So I think we should, we should continue to invest in those. I don't think they're ever going to be a white elephant, but you bang on with the NBN. You know this this country, and, I, and I've I've struggled with this for you know the last ten to fifteen years, talking to small business operators that that hear about the efficiencies that they can obtain by running services, running business applications out of the cloud, and and not running a server on their you know horrible little ADSL connection in their in their office. And you know for for so often I've bumped into situations where people just can't get access to quality infrastructure because they don't have a decent network. Now, that's that's all starting to change in Australia, but as far as I'm concerned, it can't change quickly enough, and, and it needs to be a really decent network, not, you know, not sort of, uh, you know, 10, 20 down and 10 up or 5 up or something like that. We still, we still need much better network connectivity in, in Australia. How do you think all of the, what's happening now, is going to affect the rollout of the 5G network? Um, look, I think it puts a lot more pressure on on rolling the 5G network out, you know, as quickly as you possibly can, because it provides, you know, uh, an alternative, um, you know, network opportunity for uh, for businesses and for and for consumers, um, and and takes a little bit of the pressure off. Off the NBN, I, I think it, it would be misguided to say, "Oh, well, that means that we don't need to continue to improve the quality and the capacity of the NBN," mm. because we know that that digital traffic is just going to continue to uh, to explode, and um, we need to be, you know, we need to be on the front foot and make sure that we can we can adapt to that and um, use that as effectively as possible. It is it is one of the smartest things that we can do to foster economic growth and productivity improvements in this country is to make sure that we've got great network connectivity. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to a break now. And when we come back after the ad break, uh, we'll come back to Doug and Ray and talk a little bit more about the long-term impacts of coronavirus. You're watching Switched on IT. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Is your computer driving you crazy? Is it slow or doing things you didn't expect? Well, having a computer crash or pick up a virus can be a complete nightmare for a business. So having someone local you can trust to get you up and running again is critical. The dedicated team of experts at Computer Troubleshooters Toowoomba West will put your mind at ease from the moment you walk through the door and will get your problem solved in no time with a 100% guarantee on their work. Laptops, tablets, PCs, whatever you have, Roger and the team can fix it for you. So visit them today at 236 Bridge Street, Newtown. Can't get in to see them? No worries. Just call them on 46 42 1331 and they'll come to you. Toowoomba Troubleshooters, Toowoomba West, on the web at www.computertroubleshooters.com.au forward slash Toowoomba West. Hi, I'm Neil from CGD Group and we do printing with imagination. Our products and imaging have that wow factor. Whether it be business cards, flyers, the Coffee Gazette or our brand new A5 video folders and animation. Have your business branding remembered. Call us today on 4639 5553. CGD Group, printing with imagination. Looking for exposure for your next event or function? Take your next community event, training seminar, sports event, official opening, function, concert or exhibition live to the world with PTV Channel O and Power FM's unique live simulcast. We can turn your next local event into a worldwide sensation for a fraction of what you would expect to pay. No matter what the event, PTV Channel O and Power FM can take your message to our audience. Invite the world to your party by phoning 0431 390 920 or email feedback at ptvchannelo.com. Welcome back. You're watching Switched on IT. Ray, how should businesses adapt things like their marketing strategy 
once this pandemic is over? Well, I would have said this before the pandemic, and I'll say it about after the pandemic. Uh, businesses should be focused on their digital marketing strategies uh, just like they always have been. Uh, that is looking at the market and then deciding on what digital assets they should be creating and digital campaigns they should be creating to be able to get in front of their audiences. Uh, you know, I know that there is a, a group of people out there who believe that going back to uh, in-store sales uh, with no digital strategy in mind that this is just going to be the way the world always is and that is just not the way it is um, and it's been a slow slow bleed and we're going to see more and more online purchases and people who want those options even if the retail store exists and this is why the hybrid approach is really important so when i think about current physical retail stores um, there's a short-term risk fine um, but after this is all over, they really need to start thinking about how they actually cater to their customers so that it's convenient for people to be able to buy from them as opposed to going to a big box store or going uh, elsewhere to a completely online or virtual business that can satisfy their needs. There is just going to be a demand that will outpace the efficacy of most physical retail businesses. Uh, that being the case, uh, you have to think strategically about what you're going to do and what you're going to sell in-store versus online. Uh, what I've seen is a, a wide variety of, of people making some really good choices about how they do things. Uh, there's a local coffee shop that decided to start doing a, uh, a coffee uh, you know, uh, delivery service where they were shipping coffee, uh, both uh, delivering it locally, but also shipping it uh, through their, through the, you know, various uh, postal services. And, um, and they were able to actually uh, do really well in just selling their coffee even though they weren't able to sell cups of coffee or lattes uh, in their physical retail store, it was a very nice transition for them to now start selling their coffee, uh, you know, I'm presuming nationwide, and uh, making that available on their website that wasn't before there. And I think that's really important for people to think about, well, what do you have as an asset that you can currently sell and put online potentially and or in uh, you know on on M commerce and mobile commerce to be able to get people to purchase uh, that they otherwise uh, don't need to come to your physical location in order to have access to. So there's that part. Uh, there's also the design of digital products or services that don't require in person uh, contact for people to start thinking about. I think about uh, various service professionals who uh, traditionally would meet face to face or say that you are a wine uh, store, a wine shop. Uh, you have probably a lot of expertise about wine, about grapes, about growing. Uh, maybe if you if you uh, run a vineyard and the wine, sh wine shop or, or the, the vineyard store uh, is actually a part of the winery, uh, maybe you have access to sommeliers who have lots of information about those wines. You might decide to teach this stuff online, to uh, create online uh, presence for people to be able to have access to. Uh, one particular winery, I believe in Virginia, what they've started doing is they're doing wine tastings virtually. And so people can buy three, four bottles of wine at, in, a, in, a, in a clip. They um, have it shipped to you. Um, if you're capable of having it shipped to your particular state, this is in the United States where we don't, we can't ship wine to every state from every state. It's a little odd, uh, but anyway, um, you can you can get the the uh, bottles shipped to you, and then they have a virtual wine tasting where the sommelier walks you through the various bottles that you've purchased, and you get to have a wonderful evening in a virtual environment, um, sharing the same wine with others. Uh, these kinds of virtual experiences, while they aren't ideal, I mean, it's not perfect, but if I'm someone who really loves this particular vineyard, and they're on one coast and I live on the other coast, well, I'm not gonna fly to the vineyard every week to go do a wine tasting. This virtual experience is the next best option and I would pay for the wine to be shipped to me on a regular basis, which means that they get a subscription or membership, uh, you know, a regular revenue model that has been created for uh, something that didn't exist before. And, uh, and now they have the, uh, you know, maybe they bring back their wine tastings after the pandemic, fine. But post-pandemic, they can keep the virtual experiences happening and continue to have a membership or re recurring revenue model that they can now add to the business. This helps support businesses like that after the fact. And that's not even taking into account the number of businesses that have digital um, tools and digital products that they can be creating. 
online courses, uh, ebooks, and other kinds of digital assets that can be sold. Of course, with all things digital marketing, we do have to be cautious of cybersecurity. And so, uh, Doug, what should people be thinking about as it relates to cybersecurity post pandemic? Sure. Um, you know, they, to a certain extent, the problem has just moved from the office to the home with people working remotely. Um, and then, of course, in the home, there's a little bit less scrutiny from, you know, the, the, the few people in an office that are, that are um, particularly IT savvy. So there's a, there's, there's a couple of key points. Um, one would be password security. And, and it's just, it continues to be absolutely vital that, that every, every member of staff should be using a password management tool. And the reason is they should have a different password for every single login that they have. Never use the same password because if that's cracked on something which is fairly insecure, your membership of the local soccer club and their website or something like that, if that, if that is released um, through the soccer club's website or the sports club's website and you've used it for your, for your banking and for your access to your you know, corporate information, your, your, your company email password is, is using the same password, then that just potentially opens up a whole world of trouble. So. Um, it's impossible to remember all your passwords. You must use a password management tool, something like LastPass or, or a similar product. There's, there's quite a few of them out there. Most of them are very good and very secure. Um, the second aspect of it is, is making sure that, that your devices are secure so that you have an up-to-date antivirus um, tool on them. The third thing you can do, and this would be particularly in a place like Australia where a lot of people use um, a, a Microsoft Office 365 email service, um, you should enable what is called multi-factor authentication, which as a lot of people know, that's when you know banks use it all the time. You you get a, a text message with a with a number that you then key in into the online screen to to provide a sector second factor of authentication because that confirms that you are who you say you are because it's it's not just that you knew the password for the bank account, you actually have a holding the mobile phone that is dedicated to you as well. So that's where two-factor authentication works. And you can enable multi-factor authentication for most services, and you should definitely enable um, multi-factor authentication, MFA as, as it's known, if, if you're using products like that Office 365 business email. And if you're on G Suite, you can enable MFA for G Suite as well. So I would say everybody should have multi-factor authentication enabled. That doesn't mean that you actually have to use that second factor of authentication every time you log in, because if you're logging in from a device which has been verified through MFA, then you're okay from that in the future. Another consideration is to use a virtual private network. So that's, that is like a, a private encrypted tunnel between your machine in your home office and potentially the server that has got all the um, business applications in a data center that are key to your business. And that will, that will make sure that, that um, nobody can come in from the outside and attack the, you know, basically harvest information on the network between your device and, and that endpoint. And then the final thing that I would say, and there's a lot more that we could say, but we, but we won't, is there are also services with things like Office 365. Um, there's a product called Advanced Threat Protection, and that will provide another level of, of security and protection because then you can set up things like policies. And um, imagine, if you will, for, for a moment, that if somebody got into your email system, and this is one of the, one of the you know, um, bad things that we've seen, and you're the CFO or you're the CEO, and the, and the entity or the, the bad actor that has got in is, is getting every email that you send and receive forwarded to a, a, a Gmail address somewhere in, you know, who knows where, Eastern Europe or Asia or somewhere like that. That forwarding rule can be blocked, but you need to have a product like Advanced Threat Protection. And the easiest way to, to set up those policies is, is at Oz Hosting, we provide what we call a security assessment, and, and we will implement that Advanced Threat Protection. And, and as part of that process, we will set up different policies so that, for example, people can't set up automatic um, forwarding of emails to an outside entity. Sure, you might send forward something internally to, to another colleague, um, but you can't, you can't send things permanently outside the organisation. Or to create rules where um, it is impossible to, to send on a regular basis 
files and folders from inside OneDrive, which might be you know what you're operating for all your um, corporate IP to an external entity. So without actually setting those policies up in place, it's very easy for a bad actor to to come in and create their own policies and, and enable things like that. So the thing that I would suggest is that you know um, a security assessment to tick some boxes and get a, a decent level of security is um, is an easy win as well. So the security angle is, is quite an important one to tick off as people are working remotely. Yeah, and I'll add that there has been a rash of text messaging uh, scams. Basically, people are spamming people. And of course, they're using coronavirus and COVID-19 and offering help and support and other kinds of assistance and resources or just uh, scaring them, uh, you know, like saying, uh, you might have been infected, uh, you know, you need to go uh, click this link and uh, or respond uh, in X number of hours, you know, um, claiming to be either a government agency or an authority. Uh, just remember that you should verify externally anything like that. Never click on those links, never respond to those text messages if you have any inkling uh, that they are not from uh, someone you have in your database. Uh, so if it's not someone in your in your current existing uh, database, and even then, if it just seems weird, if you're getting a text message from your uncle who you don't talk to all the time, and all of a sudden it says <laughs> you need to click on this link in order to be able to access uh, some information about COVID-19, uh, maybe you should pick up the phone and call him or her and find out uh, why they are sending you that information and making sure it is them. Uh, you, I'm, I'm seeing this also, I, I've been getting this in Facebook Messenger where people get their accounts hacked and then they're getting Facebook Messenger messages sent out to them. And uh, But SMS is probably the biggest platform right now for a lot of these types of, of, of spam-based messages that are getting people to respond and to click on links, which then of course just provides greater fodder for more infection and as well as uh, you know, other kinds of schemes that are being perpetrated by malefactors. So just be very vigilant with regard to the phishing emails and the text messaging scams and any messages that are coming at you right now, because you really have to have a little bit of a skeptical eye here uh, and making sure that, that you aren't getting uh, duped by some of these uh, criminals. Um, <clears throat> Ray, just to uh, give a, a practical example of that, uh, just um, a couple of days ago, uh, I got a message purporting to be from Microsoft um, uh, saying that uh, my Microsoft account uh, needed, uh, that somebody else had gotten into my Microsoft account and that I needed to change the password on my Microsoft account. Um, uh, I was pretty suspicious about that, so I logged into my Microsoft account. I didn't click on the link. But I did go and log into my Microsoft account and uh, got my password uh, manager to change the password just in case. Um, but um, uh, my suspicion is that that was a scam. Oh, I can bet I can bet money on that, and I'm not a betting man, but I, I would bet money on it that it was a scam. And uh, you know, th those those types of things are just the the, the tip of the iceberg. You know, we're getting all of these uh, very weird. Uh, messages about you know this is this particular government authority that, that needs you to be able to respond in X amount of time and uh, you know just mm. just really weird uh, scams but uh, unfortunately you know in, in a time where we're where we've got heightened emotions we've got higher levels of anxiety and fear going on we're much more likely to uh, do things irrationally and so we just have to take a, a moment of pause and uh, do exactly what you did which is uh, you know, recognize that this is a little bit off um, and that you should go verify externally directly with the service like Microsoft, going directly to Microsoft or um, whatever party is communicating with you, go directly to that person in another format, another medium to verify that they are actually, uh, you know, communicating with you and it's not some bot or some kind of um, other software that is uh, hacking into mm. your, your system. Yeah. All right. Um, now, um, any uh, any final comments about this before we um, close the show out? No, not from me, Gary. Ray, I I just want to echo the sentiment that businesses are more resilient when they spend the time now 
to become more resilient, not just against the pandemic, but from economic downturn to other types of natural disasters, and also things that just happen to uh, businesses internally over the course of their lifetimes. When you do this kind of infrastructure work, and when you think thoughtfully about the future, you are going to be better off in the future. Uh, and so I just, I really want to encourage people that if this is something that you want if you want the business to be resilient, if you really want to survive this, uh, put in the time now uh, to get those pieces into place and, uh, and good luck. Terrific. Thank you, Doug and Ray. Um, that's been a really, another really important discussion today. Now, if anybody out there has questions about the uh, topic that Doug and Ray have discussed today, please be sure to send us an email to feedback at ptvchannelo.com uh, or get onto our contact form on the website and send us a message. Uh, this has been Barry for Switched on IT. Um, oh, uh, don't forget that if you've missed any of these, uh, any of the series on the coronavirus or anything for that matter, you can go to our video on demand. You can pick up all of the shows. In fact, you can pick up shows for the last couple of years if you really want to have a look at what we've been talking about. Now, don't forget, too, that we are still running the TRL 40 show, but we have adapted to the coronavirus situation, and we're actually running that as a virtual show. So we're now bringing in all of the people who would normally be in the studio uh, talking about uh, rugby league. We're now bringing them in remotely, and uh, so we still have that show going. Last, last night, that show went to air. Uh, that's a live show that goes to air both on Facebook and on this site, and then uh, that will be replayed again. Uh, thank you for watching Switched on IT. Stay safe and be sure to let us know if there's anything out of this discussion today that uh, switches on a light or uh, raises questions. Uh, be sure to get in touch with us and we'll feed them back to Doug and Ray and get them to uh, discuss them in a future episode. You've been watching Switched on IT. Uh, this has been Barry. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Have you got a wedding, birthday, corporate event, or even a school disco coming up? Well, make your special occasion memorable. A professional DJ and compare really makes a difference. So go crazy with Crazy Kevin, international DJ. He's available for all your entertainment needs. Just call 0459 336 832 or email crazykevindj at gmail.com. Oz Hosting is proud to support Switched On IT in bringing practical help to Australian businesses. We're talking to literally hundreds of businesses every day about their IT services, how to make them more efficient, how to make their businesses more efficient and how to protect their valuable data. If you'd like your IT services securely hosted right here in Australia and expertly managed, talk to Oz Hosting. Kevin on the radio. Power FM. Powerfmradio.com.au.